What makes a hero? Are they forged from iron? I just finally know what I have to do. Built by science, handed to us from the heavens, or is it magic? It felt very magical to us. I think we knew we were making something special, but Marvel didn't expect Iron Man 1 to become what it was in this massive hit and the beginning of a franchise. I was really excited because of what I'd seen Marvel do with, with Iron Man. I'm always amazed when anything happens in Hollywood that's difficult that works. Obviously, there's been a bunch of superhero movies that don't work. There's got to be something Marvel is doing right. One studio set out to prove they could take their passion from page to screen. There's a bit of osmosis that comes from being part of the Marvel family, where you start thinking about the company and the kind of legacy as a whole. Everyone involved came out, I think, for the right reasons. This company loves making these films, which I think why they're so successful so far. People get their money's worth. They come with an expectation that most times exceeded, and it's very difficult to do that. So how do they do it? How does a studio make a film that fickle comic fans are actually proud of? Well, they listen. Mostly studios try to guess what people want to see, and they try to follow trends, and that only goes for so long. But this is a whole other way of playing the game, and it's very exciting, I think. And I really think it just comes down to the people. It's, it's some people just know movies. And for those of us who love movies, one studio brings us the mightiest heroes of all. Here's the trick in Marvel. We want to stay true to the characters. We want to stay true to the books. But we also don't want to be afraid to take risks occasionally with our characters. We believe that our stories are so strong and our characters are so strong that we can take chances. If you talk to Marvel fans, ask them what their favorite moments are over the years in the comics, you will almost always get a character moment out of them. It, it very rarely is it a pure action splash page moment. The reason Marvel's characters work so often is that they are so much like us. It's still the kid who gets beat up in class and wants the girl who's above his league and can't get the job and can't catch a break. And I think when you open up the books of Marvel, you relate to these people. You just don't know when to give up, do you? I can do this all day. There is a wish fulfillment aspect to, wow, I would love to be a billionaire who could travel the world and do whatever he wants or I would love to be a super soldier. Uh, but at the same time, those people have my problems and they deal with the same things I deal with. And that's why these characters endure. It's also a crucial piece to the Marvel saga at large. The way Thor deals with his father and his brothers, the way Iron Man deals with his girl Friday, the way Captain America is drawn to want to fight for his country and the patriotism that he has. We have real people real characters that just happen to be superheroes. And I, and I think that's what makes it enjoyable. Everybody worldwide can relate to that in one level or another. It's human nature. I grew up with Marvel Comics around the house, and um, my brother had Spider-Man underoos and Spider-Man sheets and Spider-Man everything. It makes for, I think, a product that um, is really attractive and charming and fun. What's important about the Marvel characters is that there is there are many different incarnations. There's the comics, there's the cartoon series, there are video games, there are movies. Some of them have had live action television series. But the core of the characters usually remains the same, right? Always from what started in the comics. That's where it all begins. The company we now know as Marvel was first known as Timely Publications and originated from the minds of Jack Kirby and Joe Simon. Together, the two writers and artists gave birth to the first true superheroes. Joe Simon and Jack Kirby putting a star in red, white, and blue on that hero, on that soldier, on that scrawny kid who yearns to be a part of the battle was brilliant. And that is where it all started. We were doing very well there. We are on top of the world with Captain America, and then we had USA Comics. Martin Goodman was the publisher there, and he had a lot of relatives working there. One of those relatives was a cousin named Stanley Lieber. Hired as an office assistant, he soon became much more. In a few short years, comic book fans from around the world would know him by his pseudonym, Stan Lee. 
I often look back at the characters that came out of Stan Lee's imagination and all of his co-creators. Jack Kirby, Joe Simon, Steve Ditko, Bill Everett, many, many others. The early 60s in the famous Marvel bullpen. And think about the characters that came out of that. Spider-Man, the Fantastic Four, the Incredible Hulk, Iron Man, Thor. It's incredible. And all the adjectives that he uses to sell his books are true about him and about all of them in that period. One of the reasons the Marvel characters have been so successful and have lasted so long is in creating them, we try to give them personality. If you get somebody who can interest the public just because of his, his or her own personality, then you add the colorful element of a superpower, then you've got something really good. At the age of just 19, Lee became the interim editor of the company, then known as Atlas Comics. But by the early 1960s, this company would also have a new name. With its continued success and its stable of superhero superstars, Marvel soon began looking to branch out beyond the publishing world. Characters like the Hulk and Spider-Man became part of Saturday morning cartoons and even feature films. Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige, who got his start with Marvel on the original X-Men film, had an idea. My memory of Kevin was he had worked, he was working for Lauren Schiller Donner at the time, and he, she kind of had him on set all the time, mostly because he was a big geek and a big X-Men fan, and we became friends and hit it off, and spent like a lot of our time just, just nerding out on all kinds of sci-fi, Star Trek, everything. And, uh, and it was great, it was great to have him there, because you know, when you're in the insanity of making a movie, and all the politics involved, and the stress, and the budget, and the schedule, it's nice to have a guy around who cares about the creative as much as you do. By the mid-2000s, Marvel began to rethink their strategy of how their characters were represented in feature films. It was early days at Marvel Studios. Avi Rod was the head of the studio at the time, and Marvel Studios had existed. I had been with the company for, for I want to say, five years, working on the X-Men films, working on the Spider-Man films. There were ups and downs on, on all the various Marvel films at that point, but they were mainly ups, and they were mainly um, amazing learning experiences because we could see the way things worked uh, that we wanted to emulate, the way we wanted to avoid in development, in choices, in, in the production. So we got to know all the writers, all the filmmakers. It got to a point that we were working hand in hand with the studio partners, bringing the filmmakers to the table, bringing writers to the table, working on it, but we never had the final say. At a certain point, as we were so in heavily involved with the movies, the thought was, can we do it ourselves? And certainly a core team of us thought that we could. It was Alan Fine from the beginning. His vision was instrumental in putting these films together. As the company that created these beloved characters, Marvel believed they could bring new and exciting dimensions to them at theaters around the world. And under the banner of Marvel Studios, the company set out to reclaim some of their characters and produce their own feature films. I started at Marvel in 2004 as an assistant, and uh, David Maisel came up with this idea, this whole financing idea that we could, we could get all the rights back to these things and put together a big slate, and we could finance it all as a slate. And as we were talking originally back in 2004 about what this slate could be, and there was this real realization as we're putting this book together of like, what characters do we have the rights to? Because that was the main question back then was, well, if we were gonna make movies, what do we have the rights to still? We don't have the rights to Spider-Man, we don't have the rights to X-Men, we don't have the rights to Fantastic Four, to Daredevil, to Ghost Rider, Punisher, we don't have the rights to any of that stuff. What do we have the rights to? We started to realize, well, we have the rights to Iron Man back. We never gave the rights to Captain America away. Universal's willing to let us make a Hulk movie if we pay for it, and we could use the Hulk in future movies. And we never give the rights to Thor to anybody. So we have Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, the Hulk. We've always had Nick Fury. Marvel historically was, was really the, the, the company that created continuity within comic books where Spider-Man, if you were reading Spider-Man, you were reading the life of Peter Parker from one issue to the next. And when one particular Spider-Man story was over and the next one started, they were all done in sequence. The same could be said for our other characters too. You know, Tony Stark's moving through his life and, and these lives are all moving in unison and sometimes those books would connect. And when they connect, those were the coolest things ever because those characters would team up uh, and sometimes they'd fight and then realize, hey, we're all on the same team and then go fight the bad guy. You about the Marvel Universe to some degree, reading about uh, this universe and, and discovering this whole other world. And I think that was the, the, the joy about having so many sources of information, um, was there was constantly new things to inspire you. And books with pictures, who doesn't like that? 
the sense that each individual installment, whether it be a film or whether it be an individual comic or a series of comics, is actually just one little brick in a larger mosaic that is the, the big picture of this entire world of fantasy where all this cool stuff happens and it's all going on and it can impact and bounce around back and forth. Would it be possible to create a similar Marvel Universe on film? With the new studio set up, the way things work now, is there more of an opportunity for a crossover here and there with Marvel characters in a movie? So say somebody might show up in a Hulk movie down the road. I think if you, you listen to the characters I named that we, that we work, are working on currently and you put them all together, there's no coincidence that that may someday equal the Avengers. I think, uh, I think just having that, that possibility on the horizon is something that excites all of us. Kevin had this really strong notion that we could bring the bigger Marvel Universe all together. The great thing is you can always peel the onion, right? The layers are so rich on every Marvel character, and the mythology is so deep that if, as long as there's that endpoint, I don't care if that endpoint is a comic or a cartoon or a pair of pajamas, it's the, 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 the surface level of the onion, and you start peeling it back and peeling it back, and it can go deep. That, you know, in the movies, we want it to be the same thing. You can watch the movie once, and there it is, surface level, hopefully it's a great time but you can keep going deeper and deeper and, and, and seeing more of the mythology and seeing more of the, of the continuity.